everyone. Uh, did you all enjoy the happy hour? Yeah? yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, our presentation is just around the corner, so we are too nervous to enjoy the happy hour. Uh, once the presentation is over, we want to enjoy plenty of the beer as uh, other parties. So now let's move on to the, our presentation. Uh, our talk is about Operation Soseki. Uh, it is a summary of research and activities uh, against the hacktivist group. Uh, we hope that the presentation will contribute uh, in anywhere to the besides Las Vegas community. Uh, first of all, I introduce today's speakers. Uh, first, my name is Ryomi Nakawa. I'm a malware analyst at the NF Laboratories in Japan. Uh, I usually research APT groups in East Asia. Uh, next, uh, he's Kaichi Sameshima. Uh, he's a threat intelligence analyst at the NTT Communications, uh, which is one of the biggest telecommunication companies in Japan. Uh, for this research, he has been working on SNS research and the peak data analysis. Uh, finally, uh, he's uh, Atsushi Kanda. Uh, he also works as uh, a threat intelligence analyst and, uh, at the uh, NTT Communications. Uh, he is an uh, excellent engineering manager and he is a specialist of the security and network field. Uh, for this research, he developed uh, our analysis system and the uh, Read the entire our operation. Uh, we all belong to the threat intelligence team, uh, NA4SEC, uh, now SEC team in Japanese at NTT Communications, and uh, we work to protect Japan's and NTT Communications uh, from cyber attacks. Okay, before we start our presentation, there are a few important things uh, I'd like everyone to keep in mind. Uh, our main topic is hacktivists. Uh, hacktivists want their names and ideologies to be known to the public. So please don't write threat doctor's name on public space like SNS. Uh, if they know they are being focused on, they may be targets you or your country or your company uh, to attract more, con more attention. Uh, in addition, some of the technical details are not described in, your, in this presentation because they may watch this YouTube live uh, and uh, they change easily their TTPS. Uh, if you want to know the technical details, uh, for example, how to extract the decryption key from the infrastructure, uh, please contact us after the presentation. Uh, we will provide the details and the useful script for research. Uh, this is our presentation agenda. Uh, first, we will introduce overview of what is Operation Soseki and uh, Hacktivist Group Profile. Next, uh, we will uh, explain how to track their activities and infrastructures. And after that, we will present the analysis of data. Uh, it is exfiltrated from the infrastructure over the year. And finally, we will summarize the insights uh, we gained from our activities against the hacktivist group. Also, let's dive into our research. Uh, to start, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, do you know him? Hmm. In this room, some people know him. Oh, so he's a no name 057. Uh, I think many of the researchers know, already know about him because he's a pro Russian hacktivist group and uh, they have been executing uh, DDoS attacks around the world. Uh, during our observations, uh, critical infrastructures in numerous countries have been targeted and uh, attacked by them. Uh, in, our, in our country, Japan, is, uh, their attacks have also damaged and many companies and governments and organizations. Uh, since February of this year, 
they have been attacked Japan many times, uh, citing uh, opposition to Russia as a reason. So we began tracking the attacks in February of the last year. So Operation Soseki is uh, our activities and uh, approach uh, against the hacktivist group, uh, no name 057. The name Soseki was inspired by the famous Japanese author, uh, this image. Uh, he's uh, Soseki Natsume, uh, whose well-known book, uh, I Am A Cat, start with the line, I am a cat as yet, uh, I have no name, uh, which is similar to the name so we select using the, this name Soseki. To research them, we joined their underground community and analyzed their dosur and infrastructure and uh, continuously monitoring their DDoS attacks and internal operations for, for over a year. As key takeaways, we will provide these three points. First is a method for analyzing and tracking the DDoS infrastructures. Second is a long-term data analysis of DDoS attacks from multiple, multiple perspectives. A third is an insight on how we should respond to hacktivists based on experience with Operation Soseki. So next, uh, before we talk about the details of our operation, we will introduce the profile of the hacktivists and their communities. Uh, once again, we introduce No Name. Uh, he's a Prussian hacktivist group who has been active since March 2022. The ideology behind the activities that are claiming legitimacy regarding Russia's invention of Ukraine and uh, criticizing those who are anti-Russia uh, such as NATO and uh, uh, corroborating Ukraine. They have been executed DDoS attacks against, against uh, countries around the world and uh, they are opposed to the Russia to spread their ideologies. Uh, unlike other hacktivists, uh, they use volunteers for their DDoS at operations. Uh, they operate the Telegram communities and the, it is a base of their operations. They gather volunteers in a Telegram community and uh, distribute a custom dosu. Uh, it is called Didoshia and encourage volunteers to join their activities and to spread ideologies. Uh, this uh, diagram shows uh, the uh, Telegram community. Uh, there are um, four major communities. Uh, first one, most, uh, most famous public channel is uh, No Name 05760. Uh, it is a public relation channel and uh, which reports of successful DDoS attacks and the news about Russia. It is posted every day. The number of subscribers increased with each report of their activities and there are about 72 subscribers now. Next, the uh, Didoshia project on left side on the new client Didoshia channels. Uh, Didoshia is uh, their original tool and uh, they developed to automate Didos attacks. Uh, these two channels are private channels which are underground communities for people who want to volunteer for DDoS attacks. Uh, in the DDoS project, uh, illegal activities take place, such as uh, discussing uh, attack targets and distributing, uh, distributing paid VPN and tool accounts. Previously, DDoS tools were also distributed here DDoS project but now volunteers are screened and only those who pass the interview process and uh, they are guided to the new client DDoS channel right side. The new client DDoS channel is a new community established uh, in March of this year. Uh, the community is still very small. Uh, it is about 300 subscribers. Uh, in the inter uh, in the interview to join the channel, people asked about the uh, affiliations and ideology, and they, uh, 
cannot join the community unless uh, they are recognized as like-minded. The approved volunteers in this channel will be able to download DDoS Shear and use the tool and execute DDoS attacks. And the DDoS Shear project distributor manual along with the tool. Uh, it's explaining how to use it. In addition, it describes that Decoin, uh, it is a, can be converted, crypto coin will be given as a reward according to the number of DDoS attack collaborations. And it also explains the OPSEC, uh, such as uh, using VPN. Uh, so it is shows that the manual covers more than just basic usage. In particular, they have recently issued a uh, call for OPSEC enhancements. Uh, in last month, uh, following the arrest of their volunteers in Spain, they have included measures to improve OPSEC, uh, such as uh, using VPN uh, as a kill switch option or uh, separating personal use of Telegram account uh, and so on. So it is expected that uh, making arrests will become difficult in the future. And finally, they also manage a bot called uh, DDoS bot, uh, which allows uh, volunteers to automatically handle dealers and rankings. Uh, the community has a ranking system uh, based on the number of successful DDoS attacks. Uh, it makes volunteers to enjoy those attacks uh, as if they are playing game. So this is a summary slide of this section. Uh, no name is a promotion hacktivist group uh, based in Telegram, and they recruit like-minded volunteers in Telegram and distribute a DOS tool called DDoS. And they maintain their DDoS infrastructure by providing various motivations to their volunteers. Uh, in other words. By joining the community and analyzing the DDoS share, uh, we could monitor the DDoS activities. So the first step uh, in tracking them is to analyze DDoS share and find out uh, its control mechanism. So from here, we will provide a detailed analysis of the DDoS share tool and their infrastructure uh, to track their activities. Uh, it's just that operation society. Uh, first, let me clarify the motivation behind the analyzing DDoS share. Uh, the primary goal is to make the DDoS share target this accessible. Uh, by doing this, we can take proactive measures for current targets and those who might be attacked in the future. Uh, another goal is uh, identify the fingerprint of their infrastructures. Uh, with this, uh, it could execute a takedown operation against them in the future. Uh, to, archive, uh, to, uh, to achieve these goals, we must be statically analysis and uh, DDoS to reveal data structure and communication algorithm. Uh, this is an overview of DDoS Shear. Uh, DDoS Shear is a merge platform enabled DOS2 uh, built in Go language and distributed to volunteers. Uh, the, the tool is provided as a set for various operation system uh, like the image uh, and various operation systems and CPU architectures uh, just executes the run for your platform. It starts the DOS attacks on machine. The executable files are separated to Russian and non Russian user, but uh, there is a data reference in their behavior, so we don't go into details. No. Uh, this is an update timeline for DDoS Shia. It has been very active with continuously updates uh, since we started our observations. Uh, then we provide a demo of DDoS Shia. This time we will use uh, Windows X64 executable file on my machine. 
other one will work just as well. So at runtime, uh, specify the IP address of the current C2 server for DDoS here uh, with hyphen P arguments. And when executed, DDoS share receive a command from C2 server and including a DDoS target list. And after a while, DDoS share return a feedback on the number of successful DOS attacks. Next in the background, uh, you can see that a uh, large number of communications are uh, being sent to the background my dummy server. So it's easy to execute the DOS attacks. So next, uh, let's analyze the internal of DDoS shear. The figure shows the result of the analysis of DDoS shear behavior. Uh, the behavior is very simple, uh, repeatedly the step one to step five, this image. At step one, DDoS shear sends a request to the client login pass of the sheet server to join as a botnet. Uh, if the login is successful, a Unix timestamp will be returned as a response from C2 server at step two. And after successful login to request the list of reduced target list, the client get target pass uh, is a step three. And finally, the encrypted toss at target list is sent to the DDoS shear, which decrypt it on memory and starts the DOS attack, it's a step four. So to summarize, uh, if we can emulate the communication of step one and step three and decrypt the response of step four, uh, we will have achieved our primary goal. To emulate the communications, uh, it is necessary to analyze the data structure and the encryption method. Uh, this slide shows an uh, example of processing data. Uh, all communications are uh, encrypted using AS256 uh, GCM mode. With the data necessary for decryption is uh, concatenated as a data head. Uh, it is ASIV and the tail. Uh, it is a GCM tag in the data. And uh, this encrypted data is um, encoded to the base 64 and converted to the JSON format uh, like this, uh, which is a basic data format for communication with C server for DDoS share. So now we understand the communication algorithm and the data structure with the sheet server so we can decrypt the command and control uh, in step four. So we try to decrypt it with a simple Python script. It was be able to it was able to extract the DOS target list, so we have achieved our primary goal. Uh, however, we have one issue. Uh, since the beginning of this year, they have started uh, changing their infrastructure at very short intervals uh, every few days. So to continuously track them, we need to find their new infrastructure within the entire internet space in few days. As a fingerprint of their infrastructure, uh, we can apply Unix timestamp response in step two. Uh, however, it is impractical to send post requests to entire internet space within a few days. So we have to adjust our approach to complete the discovery within a realistic time frame. So we decide to use a more faster internet scanner or mass scan uh, to reduce the number of scans. Uh, by using mass scan to first uh, identify only the HTTP server, uh, we can reduce the number of HTTP server post scans from billion order to around the 10 million order. Uh, finally, we execute scan only HTTP server and emulating the DDoS share bot connection uh, to find their fingerprints. Then we discover new infrastructure and get the DDoS target list within a day. 
uh, as a result, we are now able to continuously track their infrastructures and DOS target list. Uh, this is a this is a demo on how to get a uh, DOS target list. First, we prepare a list of HTTP servers uh, created with MassScan, and uh, we then perform scans on the list, uh, emulating the DDoS bot connection. Uh, okay, uh, now we can see that uh, IP address uh, starting uh, 193, it has a fingerprint of DDoS here. Next, so we emulate the communications uh, to get the DDoS target list for the, this IP address. Hmm. Okay, login success and the uh, data is displayed is a uh, decoded DDoS target list. So we can get the uh, DDoS target list from their, sheet, their infrastructure. Now that the proof of concept or uh, proof, of, proof of concept is completed, so we automated this task. We, are, you, we use uh, Apache Airflow is the backend and we get the target list via Tor. And uh, next is add fluids and TLD information. And next is store the processed data in GitHub. Uh, this process is carried out regularly and any changes are notified via struct like that. Mm. Uh, with this, uh, we can keep collecting DDoS target list and track their, move, their uh, activities. So next way is Kaichi will, Kaichi will talk the result of detailed data analysis. Okay. This is about the target list we are acquiring. For each file, it contains about 100, 350 pieces of target information. And among them, the number of unique hosts is about 10 to 50. The target list includes the target and its attack method. For the target, domains, IPs, ports, URL paths, etc. are specified. It also supports pseudo randomization using templates. For the attack method, we have confirmed DDoS attack methods of layer 7 and layer 4, such as slow release and TCP sync fraud. The format of this target list is occasionally changed. It was confirmed that the format of the target list has changed in conjunction with the times when the DDoS share sheet protocol was changed in April and November. The DDoS attack capabilities are also being updated and new features are being added as needed. It was also found that major changes are linked to the timing of updated to the DDoS share infrastructure. Next, we will discuss the transition and analysis of DDoS activities. We have collected and analyzed posts from the public Telegram channel. As for the content of the posts, there are posts that call out to commemorate at the beginning of the day's activities. We call these start of work notifications. On the contrary, at the end of the day's activities, they also, they also post new summaries. We call these end of work notifications. Also, the most common type of post is promoting the success of DDoS, DDoS attacks. This DDoS post often includes check host links to the target site and images of a browser showing that it can no longer connect to the target site. Other posts include reacting 
when their activities and features on social media or blogs. Also, the figure on the right represents the time zone when many posts are made. Assuming that this actor is active in Moscow time, UTC plus three, posts on Telegram are concentrated from around 10 a.m. to around 9 p.m. And it is clear that they are active at a clearly defined time. Next, we have visualized the timeline of Telegram posts over a long period of time. The top row represents the number of posts. The middle row is a scatter plot of the minutes of post time. The bottom row is a heat map of the days attacked for the top 10 countries that are frequently targeted. At a glance, the trends vary, trends vary depending on the time period. You can see that the trend mainly changes at the beginning of the month every few months. From the next slide, let's take a look at each. First, if we look at the timeline of the number of posts in the up section, you can see that the number of posts varies depending on time period. Also, if you look at the part after 2023, it's the red part. If you look at the area on the left, there were many posts promoting the success of DDoS attacks in orange. But if you look at the light side, you can clearly see that the orange has decreased. So have DDoS attacks decreased? That's not the case. And in fact, it's known to be on the lights. If you actually look at the content of the post, as the left side, they were doing it in the style well of one post per target. But at the light side, they changed to make one post for multiple targets. <clears throat> also, if we look closely, you can see that the bear in the picture has changed from a realistic bear to a deformed bear. And from such things, you can confirm the change in format. Next, let's talk about the posting time. The vertical axis represents minutes posted from 0 to 60. The green triangle represents the start of work notifications. Initially, when the start of work notifications began, they were posted at various times and minutes. However, from a certain point in time, the trend changes to concentrate posts from 0 to 1 minute each day. Also, it is now known that the start of work notifications have been abridged. Next, let's look at the DDoS success posts. The orange inverted triangles represent the posts promoting success of DDoS attacks. Initially, posts were made at various times and minutes. After that, although not as much as the start of work notifications, it can be seen that posts started to concentrate at times like 0 to 1 minutes and from 30 to 31 minutes. And then eventually it returned to posting at various times. In this way, it was confirmed that the posting style changed depending on the period. Finally, let's discuss the target countries in the lower section. We are displaying the top 10 countries TLD that are frequently targeted. Looking at the style of target country selection, no name has a tendency to set the main target country at the beginning of the week. And from there, they have been attacking while switching, this, switching the target countries every week. However, since about September 2023, this trend has also changed. And they have started to attack by switching the target countries on a daily basis, not on a weekly basis. Recently, there is also a trend to continue targeting the same countries again for several days. 
In this way, there were changes in the, in the operation depending on the period, even, if we, even in terms of the style of target country selection. Through these analysis, we have the following thoughts about no names activities. The fact that they have a fixed activity time centered around 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. and that they make a scheduled post every day suggests that the telegram operator is not just operating as a hobby, but is operating in a business-like manner. Also, the fact that the operation policy is regularly changed every few months and that the trend switches sharply at the beginning of the month suggests that this is an organized activity. Furthermore, the maintenance of an infrastructure capable of handling large scale requests for over two years and the fact that they have a substantial source of funds that allows them to continuously provide rewards to more than 500 supporters. Suggests that they may be sponsors who are funding no names activities in background. We are able to obtain target information from both Telegram post and the target list, and using these, we have calculated metrics such as the attack success rate. The attack success rate is calculated as the number of reports on Telegram divide, divided by the number of targets in the target list. The trend from November 2023 to December is shown in the figure on the right. <coughs> in this figure, the top row represents the number of targets included in the target list and the bottom row represents the transition of the attack success rate. Looking at the number of targets around November and December, there were about 20 targets per day, and sometimes there were more than 30 targets. The attack success rate varies greatly from day to day. It is less than 20% at its lowest, and less than 90% at its highest. We compare this with the time around February 2023 when Japan was targeted. At that time, the number of targets was around 13 and the attack success rate was less than 60%. Focusing on the number of targets, we can see that no names activities has become more active with the number of targets now about twice as many as around February 2023. Looking at the attack success rate, there are many sites where the attack has not been successful. Of course, if the attack is not successful, it cannot be promoted on Telegram. So the targets visible on Telegram are just the tip of the iceberg. We also got the impression that attacks on CGNs often fail. However, there are cases where origin is directly targeted. So region's defense remains important. Also, targets that were successfully attacked tended to be targeted repeatedly. In fact, when calculating the proportion of targets that were successful in the past among the targets included in the target list, on average, about 75% were targets that had been successful in the past. From such a situation, it can be said that it is important for the defense side not to be listed on the attack success list and how to defend against the first attack. Next, we will move at these parts. So let's move on to the next section. In this part, we will share the lessons we have learned about information sharing uh, through more than a year of dealing with these hacktivists. We have often encountered the situations where the sharing or spreading of threat intelligence has led to negative impacts. For example, the disclosure of TDPs can lead to changes in TDPs or 
the victim's information can re reinforce the attacker's sense of success and be used for further propaganda. And this is a timeline of major events regarding attacker's reaction to the disclosure of TDPs. As you can see, they appear to be particularly sensitive to the disclosure about their DDoS mechanisms or their DDoS infrastructures. Especially, we've observed several times where they switch C2 servers or change the C2 protocols within a week or two weeks of the publications of detailed reports from cybersecurity companies. Of course, these companies are doing great jobs and sharing a bunch of insightful intelligence and it might be a coincidence that the publications of reports and the changes in TDPs happens around the same time. But given an example of Avast, where these hacktivists attacked Avast shortly after they published the reports about the details of these hacktivist C2 infrastructures, it can be said that at least this actor has a significant interest in the disclosure of their internal details. The next example is about the reinforcement of propaganda. Those who have seen their posts on X or Telegram will understand that they often cite the damage information or news about the victims they have attacked to strengthen their claims. As we mentioned in the past section, this actor frequently targets organizations they have successfully attacked before. So it means spreading such victim news will reinforce their sense of success and as a result, it will pose a risk of attracting further attacks in the future. Here, we would like to revisit, re revisit what a hacktivist is. A hacktivist is someone who uses hacking techniques to promote political or social changes. Their ultimate goal is to influence public opinion by making their claims widely known. So DDoS is just one of the means of attracting public interest and they're concerned about how well their message is reaching the world. In other words, they want to make them and their activities more known. From this pers perspective, hacktivists and public disclosure of the threat intelligence are potentially incompatible. So what we have done in Operation Soseki is that we have delivered information as secretly as possible in a timely and effective manner. For example, we directly contacted targeted organization to provide specific information about exactly where they have been targeted. What we have learned from this action is from the viewpoint of the targeted organizations, early access to DDoS target information has benefits more than simply being able to begin a timely instant response. One benefit is that it clearly identifies the cause of system overload. Generally, it is difficult to distinguish between a sudden increase of benign traffic and a DDoS attack. However, having attack information can save cost of such investigation. Another benefit is from understanding the scope of the impacts. Knowing which websites are being targeted also means knowing which websites are not. This allows us to efficiently allocate our resources to handle the issue. And yes, sharing information individually is uh, time consuming and cost consuming. So we also utilize nonprofit organizations like Isaac to distribute our information. To summarize this section, 
What we have learned in dealing with hacktivists is that we need to consider information sharing tailored to the nature of threat actors. This means thinking about the balance of cost and benefits for both attackers and defenders. If sharing certain information helps us prevent future attacks or reduce the damage of an attack, it might be worth the list to spread such information. But naturally, if the defenders do not gain more benefits than the attackers, the information sharing will be a failure. Therefore, we must always ensure that our strategies provide a net benefit to our defense efforts. The same applies to the secondary information sharing. When dealing with hacktivists, the callous dissemination of information benefits the attackers more than the defenders. We need to pay close attention to what our actions bring about. So, we quickly summarize our presentations. In our presentations, we discussed the pro-Russian hacktivists I don't want to name here as uh, they might watch in this live streaming, but you know who? The key takeaways are the techniques for tracking and analyzing the DDoS infrastructures and the long-time multi-perspective study of the DDoS actor, and also the lesson learned from confronting hacktivists. And lastly, and again, please, we want you to be sure not spread publicly any information linking us or our presentations to the actor's real name, as it might irritate them. And that's all. Thank, thank all for your time and attention today. And uh, we would like to thank B-Sides for giving us such a wonderful opportunity. Uh, we'll be glad if you find our presentations insightful. And your comments and feedbacks are always welcome. So oh, enjoy your night at Las Vegas, but be careful, don't drink too much, including us. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>